I would like to introduce our next speaker, Joe Hess from HCOM. He will be presenting on 5G Quick Start. Okay, guys, that's a real gold. You just heard it from Nedhead to bed, Bellhead in 20 minutes. I've been uh, working on this stuff since I uh, first bought the guide to the telephone network back in 1973. So uh, it's taken me a little more than 20 minutes, but Hopefully we'll get at least can clear some of the confusion. Uh, we want to cover the most overhyped protocol in history, as near as I can tell. I know you all have your favorite candidates for that, but I think this one takes the cake. And our goal here is to give you enough knowledge to be believable. So you have the basics of answering any question somebody says, like uh, about 5G. And you also know where to look. For, for the hard answers and the hard questions, because some of the answers are buried pretty deep, even today. The new internet explosion, we got into this. Uh, the two of us are consultants. Uh, we identified a trend about 18 months ago that the, that the internet was just going to explode. 400 gigabit links are coming out. I'm sure a bunch of them have already been rolled out. We'll hear about it in presentations. The 5G rollout is just not going to be stopped. Uh, it can coexist with other networks, and it, you can make a lot of money by, quote, replanting your old 3G networks with 5G. This thing is going gangbusters. Also, there's another major expansion in unlicensed radio that nobody ever hears about because 5G steals all the show. Sigfox is planning to sell dollar trackers, and they have a billion customers. And uh, some of you are already working on selling LoRa. I know that from talking to you. And just in on the last session, uh, there were a lot of talks on vector routing. So, uh, uh, I mean, this stuff, it's a confluence of a lot of trends. That the Internet is not going to look the same next year. And you need to know a lot about 5G. Maybe not a lot, but you need to protect yourself with some key knowledge. Uh, one of the things that's real important is to know what 5G isn't. My little illustration shows that. Looks a lot like 4G, doesn't it? And yes, it does. Well, you can say it's LTE with an extra channel. Uh, and uh, this icon is 5GE. It's not really 5G. Uh, I saw this icon the first time about a year ago. Uh, it is a exactly what it says, LTE with an extra channel trick with 5G is you can have all the channels you're willing to buy. MIMO, multiple in, multiple output, is touted as a great 5G feature, but it's been around a while too. Uh, now what is coming out is coordinated multiple channels. So I can split one data stream across multiple radio links. You can't do that today. Uh, CRAN, I first saw CRAN 10 years ago. So it's a key component of 5G, and if you read any 5G paper, it says that 5G needs is introducing CRAN. No, it didn't. It was introduced in a test with uh, Chinese Telecom, NTT, and a bunch of other people about 10 years ago. Now, here's the one you always hear. 5G is needed for self-driving cars. No, nope. self-driving cars have been running on LTE for at least 18 months, maybe two or three years. They even got trucks running on LTE. So, no, you don't need it. What you do need it for is vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. So when the guy turns left in front of you, his car can tell your car to put on the brakes. 5G isn't necessary for the expansion of IoT. Uh, you hear a lot about this, but a lot of these run on cheaper unlicensed protocols. It's just flat too expensive to buy all of the, everything you need for 5G and then buy 5G and then buy a license and buy all of the equipment you need when you can do that a whole lot simpler with some other protocol. But there are still applications for unlicensed 5G nets at 6.2 gigahertz. So there is such a thing as unlicensed 5G. So for and what in short, there are a bunch of little exceptions in, in the 5G world uh, that are out there that kind of make it sound good sometimes. But a lot of the features have already been around. That's the bottom line of this slide. So when somebody tells you that you have to have it, maybe you don't. Uh, the basics, uh, over 500 5G sites are being set up every month. I think that number is already up to 1,000. 
we put these slides together about four or five months ago. And it is true that not even providers know where they all are. Uh, they claim to and they have lists, but I don't think they do. Um, what we can do is show you some ways to find the ones in your area. Or if you're sent out to do a marketing study, it's an easy way to do it. Uh, go find out where the sites are because a lot of these are currently fixed sites. Houston was set up about 18 months ago out in a Spring Branch, I think, district with uh, 5G fixed. Uh, downtown San Jose was wired up last uh, summer with uh, 5G fixed from point to point. Uh, so there's a lot of it that's in fixed sites and that competes with broadband, it competes with almost everything. Now, no one also knows how the communities are going to react to 5G. Uh, somebody just asked me, does 5G cause uh, coronavirus? No, nope, I don't think so. But you can hear every other rumor you want to hear. You know, the cows don't give milk. There's witches that sit on top of the tower. You name it, that's out there. Uh, and some communities don't want it. Uh, and there are some things that are concerns. Uh, one of the early complaints with 5G phones in Chicago was that they got noticeably hot. In other words, people have to set the phone down on a long phone call. And uh, also, there's not much equipment. Uh, about when we about uh, six months ago, we were trying to find equipment. Only thing I could find was a 5G hotspot. I couldn't even find a phone. Phone was uh, advanced delivery. You could order it, but you couldn't get it. So, so uh, take check it out uh, and look for sites in your area. Talk, ask the guy at the desk at the Verizon uh, shop or whatever about it. You'll get some funny answers sometimes, but there are also answers that you that you can use to understand what's really going on in the world. Um, and 5G is acronym city. I know you think that the NANOG organization is acronym organization, but it really is acronym city. 1G AMPS maybe had 10 acronyms. You could learn them all, pretty simple to understand. And you go up and up and up. Uh, 3G, it really started to get rolling, at least 25 al algorithms. But 5G has all the above, because you kind of got to know what the old ones are to relate them to the new ones. And it also has a bunch more for cloud services and virtualization. I honestly believe the bottom bullet is correct, that there are more 5G organizations than all of other mobile groups put together. Um, and in any acronym uh, beginning with 5G has a chance of being a new organization. Uh, that's very possible. But some organizations that begin with 3G still deal with 5G. We'll talk about that later. Uh, here's a couple more. You see this in every Nanog presentation, network function virtualization. Uh, it's probably been around at least seven or eight years. It's not exclusively mobile, but you do need it if you build a virtualized radio network like you've built with a 5G network because you can't have physical instances of a lot of these devices and you don't want to. What you're, one of the big economics of using uh, these uh, cloud type radio networks is you get in by one reli uh, reliability. And if you don't have net network function virtualization, you can't get that. Cups you haven't heard yet, uh, it's unified user and control plane. Uh, what happens is there's something called polar codes that allow some signals to be much more reliable than others, even though they're on the same channel. So I now can put a very reliable control signal on the same channel as a not so reliable voice channel, or so to speak. I, they're not really channels, but I can mix them up. Couldn't do that before. DSS, dynamic spectrum sharing. Uh, it allows an operator to share spectrum between 5G LTE, I mean 4G LTE and 5G. It's very common. Uh, this isn't the same as sharing of radar spectrum with Wi-Fi and the, and the citizens band, radio band. DSS is commonly used and you're gonna hear about it and people are gonna say they've got a 5G network, they'll have a 5G condensed score and they'll find that the Ericsson 5G Condensed score is more than happy to run 4G LTE. Um, you're also going to say the radio is totally changed, and it has. New radio, uh, it's a more flexible control protocol. 
it allows a wider bandwidth for radio, but it also allows a user to use multiple channels in the same group of channels, and that group of channels gets switched. So I no longer have to have individual channel switching. It's a big deal. Uh, all of the new radio bands have a R in them, uh, so you can find them. And, uh, and, but they are different, realize that. And OFDM, uh, 4G OFDM, uh, OFDMA is 5G, which is multiple instances uh, of uh, those little chunks of spectrum. Quick comparison, this is a grossly oversimplified chart. I uh, just hinted at one thing down here between 4G and 5G, how um, 5G allows multiple channels to be switched, and also how, how NR is used for 5G. Uh, you can compare them, uh, different features, and here's the big deal about this chart. Uh, different features from each, each generation of service may exist in other generations. For example, 3G release uh, 8 did include node B, which is more or less what LTE is, but yet it's 3G. So you'll see these things that are kind of mixed up. Um, and the other thing to realize is everything, the first two up there are just straight old circuit switched. 3G is a mix, uh, kind of, because there's some versions and features in 3G that aren't. And LTE and 5G and R are all digital. When you get a radio signal, it's a digital signal. Uh, and it gives you a lot more flexibility. Now, uh, the other thing to note, and this was something that was a misconception of mine, is that the frequencies really are independent of technology. Uh, everybody's going to hype 5G. Well, we're going to run it. 5,000 gigahertz, and you can run uh, one foot, but you'll get blind, blinding data downloads. No, uh, that's an exaggeration. But uh, they hype the high frequencies, and they never talk about it. Um, T-Mobile just set up a huge 5G network all across the country, and they used a 600 megahertz band that they had gotten access to because the government gave it to them. So... It's not automatic. You can run 5G anywhere. Uh, a lot of it's going to run in the old uh, 3G bands as people replant their networks. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this on later. Frequency more, because uh, this is the next slide, right? We are going to talk more about it. Uh, there's two major sets of frequencies for 5G. One of them is down below 7 gigahertz, and the other one's way up there, 24 gigahertz. But guess what? AT&T runs a 5G network in Las Vegas at 15 gigahertz. Now, it's a fixed network. If you want to see one of their towers, it's right in the parking lot of the embassy suites. So, you know, they're, it's out there, and it's not all conform. If you look at internationally, bands are all over the place, except most of them are at 3.5 gigahertz. Uh, now, the bands are kind of funny. I been around so long that I remember S-band and L-band specified by the IEEE, but they're a little bit different when you get into the bands on cell phones. And um, and in our bands are, are often called S-band or S-band 5G, but the IEEE specifies is at 2.2 to 4 gigahertz. So look it up. Don't even try it. Remember the ones that you work with all the time. But don't be embarrassed to go back and look them up. They're all on Wikipedia. There's lists all over the Internet. Uh, do not hesitate to look them up. It'll save you a lot of heartache. Uh, and, the, and there are several other in our bands, in both S-band and L-band, like I said. There's some that are called that, but there's some that aren't called that. And they're right there in the middle of the uh, IEEE designations. So if it sounds confusing, it is. Uh, was it made to be that way? I hope not, but that's the way it's turned out. Uh, right now is a great time to get on board with 5G because the press is covering it very, very well. Everything is being published, and much of it is indexed, so you can find it. I mean, even by rain, product went online and told everybody what their network looks like. Uh, and who they bought it from, how it's going to run, how they, what they're going to do with it in the future. 
uh, and there's a company that publishes this. They're expensive telegeography. If you haven't heard about them, they're good guys. They really know what they're doing. They present it in Anog as well. You'll see them about every two, two years showing up. And they have a blog. And the stuff that we need to know is all in their blog. They'll tell you that such and such is just start up, set up a network like this and follow them right now. Uh, you can follow this stuff and learn about it a bit at a time. Just get on a mailing list or two, um, and they'll explain them. Now, my personal experience has been that once the rush is over and everything's set up, this information gets very hard to come by. If somebody walks up and said, you know, uh, a year from now and said, what is Bahrain doing for cellular telephony or whatever, or what is they doing for smartphones? It's going to be hard to find out. They're not going to want to tell anybody because they're so, so terrified somebody's going to listen to it. So our, the people that sold it to them don't want anyone knowing that that's their customer. So now's the chance to get on board with it. Give your, put yourself on a few mailing lists. You'll learn a lot. Uh, new radio is a 5G component. We talked a little about the frequencies. It's the replacement for LTE and the UMTS, Universal Mobile Telecommuting Service. Now, it can run in two modes. Um, new radio can run where it has a 5G condensed core, and it can run LTE uh, on the, on, uh, using the LTE core. So I can put new radio on top of an LTE core for transition, and all but two networks run this way today. Uh, one of them is T-Mobile and the other one is Korean Telecom. Uh, and even the, and neither one of them is that large. Uh, like we said earlier, the, the bands are shown with an N and, the, and then they have a different structure. So what we're saying is be aware that they can use the LTE condensed core and Ericsson sells that a lot. They don't have to use the 5G core, but a few people do. And it's going to be more later on because you don't get some of the benefits if you run the LTE core. All right, why the virtualization? This is a lot of different ones. Uh, the CRAN we, uh, is, takes a baseband unit and pulls it back to a central location. So now I've kind of got a virtualized uh, baseband. It makes for real, it allows things to be much less expensive. Also gives you some more in plus, in by one reliability. Now, virtual radio access network does not have the cell towers tied to specific areas. So if, if like a freeway, if there's a big traffic jam on the freeway, I can share that traffic from that traffic jam across two or three towers rather than having being forced into the tower that's closest to the cars that are stopped. Now here's one that's tricky, open radio access network. This is a free-for-all. Now there's two definitions of it. One is that any antenna be, can be used with any cell or phone. So I can take this antenna and it can be a part of this other network and nobody's the wiser, nobody cares. It also can be used for open source radio network software. That stuff's out there if you're really into this and want to program it, now is not a bad time to start because you can get on board w very early on with open source software that's going to drive a lot of this stuff. Here's a drawing of the last slide. Basically, you can see the old system where they were dedicated uh, front hall and then how uh, we split up some of the functionality and allow it to be virtualized. Now, all of a sudden, multiple towers uh, fit uh, a new, uh, the common centralized unit. So I no longer have to have everything on this one big uh, baseband unit and it's out in the field and somebody, I'm gonna have to pay somebody a lot of money to set up. Because I, I gotta pay uh, uh, power on that thing too and it may be hard to get to and I may have to run a special power line to it. So there's a lot of, a lot of advantages with CRAN. MIMO, massive in, massive out. Uh, this is a little bit an interesting concept too because it once in the same time it's a little more complicated than you would first think. You just think, oh, okay, I've got four antennas. I'm going to set up four different communications. 
uh, not so much four antennas. I'm going to have uh, signals that are being received maybe by four antennas or an antenna array that's directive, that I can have these virtual channels, uh, uh, spatial, uh, virtual spatial channels on my antenna. And one of those little tricks these guys play is they use multipath to develop multiple channels as shown here. If two, I don't, I don't know how many of you have run microwave or run microwave links or anything, but you know the planes are terrible for microwave because out there you get multipath to beat the band. Uh, but uh, it's multipath that kills you because they're just slightly out of sequence. Well, what happens here is you use multipath that bounces off a building, so the two paths between the two antennas are appreciably different. So you can actually see them as different paths uh, in your radio control software and you can assign them even maybe to different antennas. So I know that if I use this antenna, well, I'll say different antennas, different configurations are different drive vectors of the antenna array, I can bounce this thing off a mountain and it's going to have an appreciably different phase than the one that I'm sending direct. So this is an interesting concept, and uh, right now you got phones with two antennas in it up and down, but you're going to see some with maybe a, a third. I, I, there's a little bit of confusion on my part as how far that's going to go. I've taken one or two of them apart and spent a little time on it, and it's uh, and, even, and it's not clear totally to me yet. And I'll tell you what I don't know. Uh, later on, we're going to put in a email for. Uh, John and I, and you can send us any question you want. I found out, uh, you can even send us a dead phone if you want to. I found out that while we're working on this, the more questions we get from people, the better we understand it and the more helpful we are. More on MIMO, here's a couple antennas. One at the left is a Qualcomm test antenna, plane array of 256 elements. Um, and these things can be multiplexed over a neighborhood, so I can have two of them bunches of them and uh, they point at different houses depending on who's got the traffic uh, and you can also gang them together so that I can focus the energy on that traffic jam not only can I are my resources virtualized but the antennas can be ganged up uh, and down here at the bottom this is not obvious so I can define polarization as well as a beam formed by the multiple arrays uh, so the uh, so I can have horizontal and vertical polarization, and that's two channels. So oh, but, and also there uh, AT and T uses two by two antennas in San Francisco, and this is a little bit late getting to press. But had I got it in, you could have gotten some free service uh, for a month or two. You might still ask them about it. Uh, the Disney Network I mentioned earlier also uses two by two antennas. They're little small things, uh, look like a, gosh, cookie tin. Maps, now this is something we spend a lot of time on. Uh, the best map of all of the installations is it up there at the link at Ookla. Um, and they're kept up based on license data, sale data, and also uh, just going around and asking as near as I can tell. I have yet to find a map that's 100% complete or inaccurate, uh, and sometimes they don't really say who's the guy running. It might be a tower that's leased out, so it might lease the uh, lease or rather than the leasee. But they're out there. If you want to find a tower, there's plenty of maps. The countries have them too. Uh, Ireland, here's one of Ireland and Dublin. They were one of the very early 5G test sites. And bless their hearts, they even went out and set up uh, a map to let you know where they all are. Uh, this is the dockyards, the Dublin dockyards. And you can zoom in on these, and I'll tell you where it is, what frequency it's on, and everything. There's uh, other sources of tower data. Everybody has a license list. The FCC does if you're in the U.S. And there's – and and there's a good here. LifeWire also has an article about licenses and where to find stuff. They may again not have it exactly what you're looking for. On-site tools. Okay, uh, 
one of the things, if you're in this business, I would encourage you to get yourself an SDR. It's a great learning tool, um, and you can get one that goes up to 6 gigahertz uh, relatively inexpensively. Millimeter wave sites above 10 gigahertz, uh, it's going to, you got to get a mixer, and it's not an easy thing to put together. It's going to cost you around $800 or $1,000 by the time you're all done. Might be something you want to do, uh, particularly if uh, you're really into it, you're a student, or maybe you can get your school to pay for it. Uh, it also is a good microwave learning site. After you get your mixer working with your receiver, uh, troubleshooting uh, the tower site might be a lot easier for you. Uh, now, the best utility for all these things is the Qualcomm rocket utility. Uh, you can maybe get it from Qualcomm. They don't like to give it away, but they will. And it's, it's been around for a while, and you have to have a jailbroken Android phone, and it'll see uh, what the phone is seeing in mobile con conversations. It won't tell you necessarily what the antenna is doing or what uh, the some of the core software on the back end of all this stuff is doing, but it will tell you what the phone thinks it's seeing in terms of service, uh, you know, there's four error correction rate, the error rates, all kinds of things. It's a good tool. Uh, might try asking around if you know somebody at Qualcomm too. And what about phones? Uh, right now, almost everything's hotspot and fixed endpoints. Uh, and, not all, and not all of them work on more, on more than one or two five gigabit frequencies, but most of these guys the phones, anyway, that you see are today, or at least a couple of months ago when I put this slide together, were very expensive. Uh, they are about $1,000, and uh, some of them would support up to five or six frequency bands just because you did, there weren't that there many 5G towers out there, and uh, you didn't know where you were going to land. Uh, 5G is not international. I mentioned that 3.5 gigahertz frequencies are kind of standard. They're uh, not really used in the U.S. They're used every, a lot of other places, but not everywhere. Uh, I have a chart of these things that I use. There's one in Wikipedia that's out of date, but still a good place to start. And they're all over the board in all of these countries. And every country has at least three or four or five G frequency bands. So your phone is going to come up with more radios, more I don't know what they're going to do about the antennas because broadband antennas don't have very high gain. But anyway, you want to list a phone. Here it is. Here's a list of devices. This guy maintains this, or at least he was. You can also just do a search and you'll find them. Uh, if you do a search on eBay, you'll find about 100 phones and only one or two of them will do 5G, real 5G. Uh, phone forensics. This is an area that I had never heard of and I put it in here just because we discovered it when we were putting these slides together. And uh, there's so much hacking into phones these days that, and there's what's the tool set. I know the tool sets for Windows and Linux and those kinds of things, but there exists for phones too. And uh, Celebrite has a really good paper. I've referenced it down there. If you're interested in phone forensics or seeing what's on your phone, you can get a little bit of stuff from Celebrite. At least they can tell you what's happening. Now, uh, IoT sensor information is a big deal, and it isn't clear yet how people are going to troubleshoot IoT, uh, other than having somebody dig into it and say, this is this thing, or whatever. Uh, so, but anyway, you can, if you're interested in phone forensics, look up Celebrite, uh, give you a good start on things. And uh, then you can play around with some of it yourself. I personally think my iPhone has been hacked. Uh, no SIM installed. That's a good, if you ever get that message, there's a good chance that there's somebody has gotten into the thing somehow. Uh, if you have problems with your Apple ID uh, and steer clear of, my wife loved uh, naughty piggies. Well, they were very naughty piggies indeed. Uh, troubleshooting fiber connections. Uh, this is a tool, uh, it's called a timing, uh, time domain reflectometer. If you're doing this and you're out trying to do any troubleshooting of the fiber itself, and you're going to may have to do some of that 
we get into the phone side or the bellhead side of the business. And uh, something I'd never heard of called an IOLM or Interactive Optical TDR. What it does is read the fiber characteristics so you don't have to set all the parameters. It's, uh, they aren't cheap. Uh, a regular TDR is dirt cheap. I think you get one for about $50 now. So uh, do that. And if you're having to do this on a regular basis as part of your job and you don't have an IOLM, uh, go find somebody um, and say, hey, this is what we need. It does make it, it, according to what I've read about these things, it cuts the troubleshooting time down by an order of magnitude. Uh, mobile phone based utilities. Now, some people have gone out and written some mobile phone based utilities. Uh, some of them are nothing much. They just go out and read what's in settings. Uh, None support 5G. Uh, iPhone net analyzer, uh, RF analyzer is the one I show there, I think. And it has, what it does is real simple. It will show you what, who it thinks you're connected to, what kind of power you got. And then rather than measure all the other towers, it has a database that it has created, sort of like the Atlas database for uh, BGP, of where this reception's good and bad from different vendors. Uh, they collect the data uh, off of some of their utilities, and then they put it on a map, and it's not bad. Um, and, uh, there's, and what's gonna happen with 5G? Is any of this gonna work? Well, it says here, probably uh, not just yet. Uh, what happens is the classes for cell info change, so these things aren't gonna support 5G for a while, but uh, if you're in this business and you're trying to learn more about phones, uh, you need to look at some of these things. Uh, they give you some good insight and uh, load them up on your machine. I haven't had any problems with any of them breaking into my phone. Uh, uh, you have to run uh, location services to have them work right, which is too bad. But uh, anyway, they work if you run those services. Network issues with 5G. Okay. Uh, you guys have probably been waiting for this. Well, this is a very short summary because there's just not that much information out there yet. Uh, high throughput, low latency, and best buffering you can possibly get on your routers that face it. And the other thing is happening, I don't know whether you guys have seen this yet, but NVIDIA introduced a new edge uh, chip that allows you to have a lot more information right on the edge of the network. So the uh what you're going to see is more and more big globs of information coming from these little chips as they refresh their cache and they go have to look stuff up and then a lot less of the small queries that you see today uh, and low latency applications written for 5g may not work on a 4g network uh, there may be a race condition or it may not be able to one I mentioned earlier, like the car to car communication, uh, that's not going to work run on a 5 4G network, but nobody would expect it to. Uh, now, here's the thing if you're interested, if you're a programmer or you know somebody who is, um, all the objects are different. Uh, like I said, uh, in the radio's different, the programmer has to identify that, and the objects like the one I just mentioned on the Android phone, are different for 5G and 4G because the parameters are different. Now, why are we doing this? Well, the answer is somebody's going to start asking you questions about 5G. And I thought it only fair to throw in a couple interview questions and some hints about how to prepare for this. Because I get answered, asked questions about 5G, and I like to ask, and I like to answer them. I also like to ask them, but... In order to get good answers, you have to ask good questions. Uh, so cuts both ways. So here's one trick question. Does 5GPP replace 3GPP in developing 5G standards? This is the 5, uh, 3GPP is the standards committee that's developed everything since GSM. It's well known. So it would be logical that 5GPP would replace it. Nope but they hung with 3GPP. They just kept right on going to 4G and 5G. Now, millimeter waves. You can get almost as many answers to this question as you want to, but this is what I thought was a definitive answer by two guys that don't do anything except work on cell phones. 
are the and so are the 5G and 6G bands considered millimeter wave bands? No, they're already in use. Uh, 8G is usually thought of as a millimeter wave, but the traditional millimeter wave band is RF above 10 gigahertz, and so. 5G, 5 and 6 gigahertz spans are not millimeter waves. Now, if you're talking to a salesman in a store, I can guarantee you they're probably super millimeter waves, but they aren't technically millimeter waves. You got to give above 10 gigahertz. By the way, that's the same break point we saw earlier, FR1 and FR2, uh, the, the low end and then everything above 24 gigahertz. Uh, that also falls that way. And then there's uh, somebody already has a list of interview questions on 5G. And there it is. I've given you a link to it. And if you want uh, to learn a lot more about this, I can point you in two really good directions. The IEEE has at least 15 education pieces on it. There's a link to it. And the other guys that really do a good job is probably a company you may not have heard of called Roden Shorts. Uh, and uh, they're a German company, and they do everything RF. And they have some outstanding papers. So if you get interested, check out Roden Schwartz and check out the IEEE. Well, that's about it for now. I want to we're going to drop off here. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope we've provided some good information. Uh, we hope, hope we provided a little more clarity. Like I said, this is a very unclear field, and I honestly think some people are trying to muddy the water even more. So thanks a lot, and uh, this is it. Uh, you can send us emails if you got more questions, or we're going to take some questions now. Okay, we have a few little demos here. It's kind of hard to demo here at, you know, over Zoom, but this is a little directional antenna. It costs $15. This runs at 850 to 950. Guess what? The band that a lot of US cell phones are on. So you can use this thing. This is the Hack One RF. Put them together. You can see the phones coming and going on this thing. Uh, you can measure the uh, where they are, and you can also get a good a feel for the power. All this little tool is not accurate for giving you an accurate measure on power me measurements. And the software that you normally, I use a lot, I put on a Linux machine, and uh, there it is. This is uh, GPR, uh, GQRX, and it acts like a spectrum analyzer. I'm running this off a $20 little dongle here, and you can get these things anywhere. Uh, Ubertooth One is a lot like this. It took me about an hour and a half to put this together. So if you're interested in RF, you're interested in phones, uh, this is easy. Uh, the setup with the Hack one RF costs a total of, I think, about $400 counting the, the uh, radio, the computer, and the antenna. This one here, uh, the PC was free and the thing cost $20. Don't be scared of it. It's easy to do. Well, that's all I've got. Thanks a lot for watching. Go, Elizabeth. Thanks a lot for that, Joe. That was really interesting. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come into the queue. The first question is Wi-Fi 6 or 5G for enterprise deployments? If you have a mobile device that has to have handoffs, you go with the 5G. Otherwise, you go with the Wi-Fi. It's kind of tricky to get good mobile uh, handoffs with uh, Wi-Fi. That's why Disneyland, I think, chose 5G, is they have all those moving uh, floats and all kinds of stuff like that. You, so they can move around and they'll they'll have a continuous session. With Wi-Fi, you got to put up repeaters and a bunch of other stuff. Next. Or. Thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, the next question is, what, in your opinion, is a killer app for 5G? I would say selling something to a venture capitalist would be the number one killer app because somebody would probably buy it right now. Uh, but gaming is up there. They're wiring all the stadiums, and you have to believe that's for on-premises betting or something, so you have super low latency. It could also be for something like you see for advertising auctions where you need low latency in a limited space or something like that. 
Just think low latency. That makes sense. Thank you. The next question is, is there an expectation that 5G takes over the entire footprint that 4G is servicing now? Do you imagine that they'll run as parallel networks serving different purposes? They'll probably run as parallel networks for a long time just because uh, you don't need some of the features of 5G in a lot of places, and it's expensive. And uh, so why do it? Uh, and uh, there are only two uh, standalone networks now. I think it, I answered this in another question, too. But... Uh, one's in Korea and one's T-Mobile, and that means it's pure 5G and it runs uh, without any 4G in the network and runs the uh, 5G condensed core. Okay, thank you. The next question is, uh, the, the person says, I'd like to know more about private 5G networks. Can I have one that gateways to the public telephony net or the internet? Can I have one that is completely private? Can I use one to ship non-IP data around between two stations? Or can I create ad hoc networks between vehicles? Those no, are a lot that's of questions. part of the last one, uh, which is I didn't answer earlier, which is uh, if you ship pr private non-IP data around, you have to encapsulate it. The traffic on a 5G network, the RF, is IP. So you're going to have to do some kind of thing there. You don't have the case where I can set up a dedicated link like I do at 10 and 2G and just put anything I want down it. No, can't do that. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, private networks, uh, our little group of two here believes we've been forecasting that private networks are a really big deal now for four years. And there is one in existence. AT&T sells a first responders network that's really kind of not a private network, but I think they'll give you your own dial plan and a few other things. But when you get virtualization in 5G, you can have one anywhere. And uh, um, there is one. There's and, and private networks are already around. Uh, there's a guy that comes to the Nanog, or at least he used to, that runs the Burning Man uh, phone network. And that's a private network. It has a gateway to the BTS. So I enter the other cellular system. He buys a link from somebody and operates as a uh, virtual mobile operator, VMO. So you have kind of private networks with VMOs now, but true private networks, you're going to have to wait till you get uh, ORAN and uh, virtualization in 5G. Okay, thank you. The next question is, which emailing lists do, do you keep up do you keep up on 5G progress? Uh, which of the emailing lists would you recommend? Uh, if you're doing it internationally, you can't get away without uh, either at least following telegeography. They, they're really nice guys and their blog will post almost everything. Uh, if you're really into it and if, and you're having to uh, bid internationally, you got to subscribe to them. And they're not cheap. And if you have to set up towers and bid for bandwidth, there's a million people you can deal with and you'll find them. They make lists of towers. They can tell you where to get the space, everything. Now, if you're like us, where uh, we spend more time on figuring out what's going on uh, than, than trying to figure out which piece of spectrum we're going to put a bid on, uh, then RCR Wireless is very good. There's another lot of guys named Fierce Wireless, and they're both they're also really good. And if you look around, you'll probably find a few more. And uh, Rody and Schwartz has a blog, and the IEEE has a really good blog on 5G as well. And they have like 12 classes on 5G, and so does Rody and Schwartz. So if you you can educate yourself to the point. Uh, of being a real expert and be ahead of some of the guys that are out there hanging off the side of a tower. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. The next question is, is the U.S. really that far behind the rest of the world with 5G? And if so, why? Uh, I don't think they are. Uh, we just don't have as much need for it. So you see a lot more of it deployed. For example, uh, Monaco has been has every phone in the country on 5G, and it's been that way now for two years uh, because they have the money. There's only 3,500 phones in the whole country. So, uh, you know, so are we behind them because we're not 100%? No. Uh, and some people have to use it, like China, because they have too many, have very high-density environments. They need high bandwidth and low frequency, I mean, high frequencies. So uh, as far as the technology goes, uh, some people do build better. And this is another question, so I'll answer it here. 
uh, Huawei builds really good radios, guys. They really do. And uh, it's something that I don't know why they do that, but they do. <laughs> that, that was the next question. Of Is Huawei uh, well ahead of the U.S. on deployment and research and development? Yeah, radios. Well, it sounds like we're actually out of time right now. So I'm going to thank you very much for coming to talk with us today and for answering questions. It was uh, really great to hear from you. Thank you. And this ends this portion of the meeting.